Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week, we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever expanding geekoverse, or maybe bugs. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me on this episode is my co host, Mike Totocon Kafis. I don't care how small it is, a jumping spider can kill. That's not true. That's not true at all. Don't fight me. Don't fly, maybe. (laughs) Hashtag don't fight me. And on this episode, (laughs) we are talking with Nancy. Watch me butcher this. Mayorelli? Mirelli. So close. Mirelli. Oh, close. Sorry. Uh, (laughs) Nancy Mirelli is an entomologist and self proclaimed bug lover living in Quito? Quito? Quito. What's that? Quito, Quito, Ecuador. Oh, that's so cute. Quito, Ecuador. I know. After, after finishing her master's degree in entomology, she promptly adventured to Ecuador, where she lived with her head in the clouds for two years, volunteering in the Ecuadorian cloud forest. After that, she decided that teaching unsuspecting tourists the hidden world of insects in this beautiful country that she fell in love with would be her life's work. Now, Nancy has her own tourism business focused on ecology, insects, and conservation within Ecuador's plentiful and breathtaking ecosystems. And she runs Cybugs, which is how I found her. Nancy, welcome (laughs) to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, actually, well, that's a lie. It's not how I found you. It's how I figured out how to or Contact decided me. to bring you back on because because we had you on before with Joe Ballinger blah, 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 mm-hmm. two, three years ago, something like that. I think it might have been like 2015. Yeah. Could, like that. could yeah. be. Yeah, we're talking yeah, about I, zombie ants. We, we were, yes. Yeah. And surprisingly, that hasn't left my life because everyone is interested about zombie ants. Yeah, it's cool because it's neat. It's neat. But you're doing some really cool stuff now um, down in Ecuador. So tell me, tell us a little bit about Ecuador. I mean, this seems like a really awesome country. Yes, I love Ecuador. Like all the Ecuadorians ask me, like, what do you love most about Ecuador? And for me, um, so Ecuador is about the size of Colorado. It's a pretty small country, but it has systems and it has so many different eco zones that like I'm in Quito right now. I'm at about 9,000 feet in my apartment. And in an hour and a half, I'll be at 6,000 feet and in the rainforest. And so I go from like dry desert, like dry forest, paramo to cloud forest in an hour and a half. And to me, just the fact that you can do that so easily, you just like get on a bus and all of a sudden you're in the rainforest is just absolutely amazing to me. So I think that's my favorite part is just the diversity of ecosystems, which obviously lends itself to the diversity of, of course, insects. Um, And then just being able to bring people around and show them like, oh, yeah, we're going to go to the like the mangroves and then we're going to go to the rainforest and then we're going to go to the Amazon and then we're going to go to the cloud forest and then we're going to go to these volcanic lakes and then we're going to go to the Paramo all in like six days. So what is the temperature where you are at your level now? Um, at night it drops down to about 45, 50 degrees. And then during the day, it's about like 70 to 75 ish. Um, so it's actually pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's like eternal spring all the time. So can you tell me more about a cloud forest? Because Mm -hmm. uh, at first I, you know, I, I have a little kid brain and so I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, something artsy and, and neat, but I have a, a more. I think I have a better understanding of what it probably is. Is more so like it's the rainforest in an area on the, the in the mountains where it's very cloudy and and misty. And yeah. That, okay. And, and it really does look like something out of a fairy tale. <laughs> There's, um, it's one of my favorite ecosystems. At pretty in Ecuador, at least the cloud forest is ranges from about um, like four thousand ish feet to about six thousand ish feet. There's a little bit the ones mm-hmm. that are a little bit higher, um, but it's. Uh, defined by the amount of rain it gets, but it also is defined by the fact that it, the clouds literally run into it. Um, so at lower elevations, because the clouds are like hit the mountain and get pushed up, then mm. like they drop all their rain, right? And then when you get to the higher cloud forests where all the clouds have dropped all their rain already, that cloud forest gets its moisture mainly from the clouds themselves. So up mm. there, it's like, you'll be eating breakfast and it's bright and sunny. And then at lunch, you like check your watch and at like one, it starts like the clouds literally start rolling in. You can watch the clouds just literally fly right in front of your face. And it's just like, and it's like, it's fog. I mean, it is fog because it's at 4,000 feet, but because it's at 4,000 feet, the fog fog is like clouds that people are seeing like down there. (laughs) Yeah. If you want to see some amazing pictures, 
definitely you have to uh check out nancy's instagram because um, there, yeah. I, I just i could like i i literally i was like i gotta get back to work but i just i'm like scrolling through <laughs> and i'm just like oh my goodness so that's amazing and it, like and the pictures don't even do it justice like there's no way to even get like a 360 view of just sunlit clouds and the mountains that's completely green and it's like you literally feel like you walked into lord of the rings Wow, that that's really cool. Yeah, when we talk about the the clouds coming in like that, when I was I was in Hawaii one time, uh, on Maui, and it has the it has the two mountainous regions, uh, and there's one on the what they call the brown side of the mountain, where the the other side's a rainforest. So the you know the wind mm -hmm. comes in, drops all the rain off, and then the other side kind of gets baked. Uh, but you can you can take you can horse horseback ride down into that that um because it's you know it's a dead volcano, you can horseback down and ride down into the crater. And we were in there, and we had our we had our lunch. And as we were riding out, the clouds—if you look back, you could see the clouds literally pouring into it like a bowl being Aww. filled with cloud. It oh, that's amazing! Really cool. <laughs> that's amazing. One of the cool things about Ecuador is, um, and this is what makes it unique, actually, is like the prevailing winds come from the east to west. So that's why we have the Amazon on the eastern side of the country. But unlike Peru and Chile, we have the Humboldt current runs up the at the western side and that gives us winds that run from west to east as well so you actually have jungle on both sides of the mountains which I, a lot of people don't know they're like oh isn't the western side desert no it's not it's like full tropical lush forest there's mangroves like we have the tallest mangroves in the world here they're big oh. trees they're like 120 foot trees are the mangroves you can like stand on a boardwalk and then like still look up at the prop roots coming down from these mangroves it's Nice. <laughs> hey, Jonathan asked. So we got people in the chat room, and Jonathan. Oh, good. Jonathan asked if they uh, if they shot arachnophobia there. I don't know if they oh, no, shot arachnophobia. Sorry, it was Paul. Paul Nunes. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. No, I'm not actually sure if they shot arachnophobia here. To be honest. Okay. I I just I. But that sounds kind of familiar because there's something about a cave that you could drop down into this cave. Uh, they found this big open like I don't know. It was like a like a big pit cave thing and there were uh, it's based on you know like it's inspired by something that's real and apparently there were some species down there that don't live anywhere else because they've been isolated from the rest of the world for however long uh, hmm. uh, but whatever yeah. uh, anyway, so, so you do a lot of conservation work yeah so that's basically my focus with these tours is talking about conservation issues and not only like national parks but also um like individual conservation efforts. Oh, there's a lot of private reserves here. There's a lot of people who are just like, wow, like on the coast, for example, I love bringing people down to the coast because you can really see, um, I'm not necessarily like the battle, but you can see like the struggle between, hey, these people need to use the land for farming. Like that's where our chocolate comes from. And last time I checked, people like chocolate. Um, and bananas also come from that area. And palm oil also comes from that area. Um, so you can see the struggle of like actually needing to use the land so that way the people ha get money and can live and also trying to conserve it. And the coast is 95% deforested. So finding people who are doing these really interesting projects of like sustainable farming or, you know, they have a traditional f farm on the first half of their land, but they've they've preserved the second half just because, you know, they're like, oh, it's actually important that we have monkeys here. So I, I personally love bringing people to the coast for that reason, because all of a sudden these things that we talk about like on social media or in textbooks isn't, isn't just something that you see on social media or in textbooks. It's something that you're in and you're living and you're thinking about it and you're like, wow, like these like conservation is a problem because it's a complicated issue. Right. If it weren't complicated, it would have been solved already. And <laughs> yeah. I think when you're in it, and, and you see it and you're like, oh, wow, like these people need this or like there's no trash service down here. You know, we talk about pollution a lot. And um, one of my points, I just did a thing on bio tweeps and I was like, hey, like, you know, when you throw your like, imagine if you take your plastic to the beach and then you there's no trash can on the beach to throw it in. And then there's no trash collection at your house either. Like, hmm. what's the difference between throwing it on the ground and throwing it on the ground at your house and burning it later, you know? Like, <laughs> so it's these kind of questions that, that really make, make me very interested in the, and in, in like the, this situation of conservation. And that I hope gives people more like a realistic 
idea of what conservation is. Right. We, we take the, the level of infrastructure that we have in our first world for granted. You know, it's, it's easy to say you should, you know, you should recycle. And, and you know, it's like, well, how are they going to recycle? There's no infrastructure for it. Exactly. Like um, I was doing earthquake relief in Ecuador and I was helping out this small village and I was like, everyone's just throwing their trash on the ground. And then I was like, oh, there's no there's no trash dumpster. Like there's nowhere to even throw the trash. So then I was like, All right, we're going to build a trash dumpster. And I, I went to the president of the, of the county basically and was like, hey, your trash truck basically like goes up the road. So could it like maybe make a left and just go and like take out the trash here? And we got that to happen. And then like two years later, there was like an overthrow in the government. And then um, the new president of the county decided that trash wasn't important at all and cut it to the entire sector. Oh, my goodness. Like, what do you do? You know, like, and these are the things that we're up against when huh. we're talking about like ocean pollution and plastic pollution and like that area of conservation. And wow, I mean, <laughs> I don't have good answers. Right, right. Wow, thanks, Killjoy. Oh, yeah, man. No, no, it's no. That's all oh, yeah, tonight. No. <laughs> no, that's, no but, it, but it's it's important to talk about it because, you know, the, it, there's this other side to those sort of things. You know, it's, it's great to talk about conservation, but uh, it's also great to talk about, you know, how do you, how do you help people who would like to do those things but cannot? How do you get it's, that there? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I post the question to other people, like if you, for instance, what if you didn't have a car um, and you had to collect all your trash of your entire family for the week and then get on the bus for two hours with it to dispose of it properly? Like, would you or would you just throw it on the ground? Right. That would definitely be something where we would want to have a grassroots thing going on right like mm -hmm. even from neighborhood to neighborhood like even just yeah. if you're gonna have a trash burning or i mean whatever you can do to whatever mm -hmm. yeah wow and i'm i'm really good friends with a woman who lives in this area of Montpiche where they don't have uh regular trash for example and she has all these really cool recycling projects that she does and she tries to involve like the local community with it so that's that's on one of my tours is like hey you know we have this big problem here um but here's one of my friends who's like trying to do this grassroots like recycling stuff so can you tell us a little bit more about the tour itself? Like, what are you doing? Sure. Uh, yeah, so they're actually personalized tours. Uh, I do work with a few people and we do like create a customized tour for a specific clientele. But pretty generally, um, people just contact me and are like, hey, I'm interested in visiting Ecuador and I'm not particularly interested in doing the super touristy things. And so then I send them a survey, like what kind of ecosystems are you interested? Do you like wildlife tours? Are you interested in conservation? Do you want to like nightlife, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, and then how long? And of course, a little bit of a, but of a budget, right? <laughs> so I know what I'm working with. And then I like build you a personalized custom tour with me around that. Um, so, so I like take you basically to the types of ecosystems that you want to go and it's all under the umbrella of, Hey, I'll talk to you about the conservation in this area. I'll talk to you about the ecology because the ecology from like the paramo to the mangroves is completely different. Of course, we're going to look for bugs. Um, of course, we're just going to look for, uh, like any kind of wildlife we can find. I'm not particularly picky. <laughs> birds are difficult for me, but if you really want to do birds, like I get a bird guide for us. So yeah, it's like completely customizable. And that's what I really like about it is that I don't feel like I'm doing the same thing all the time. Hmm. And this is how you're sustaining your, your living down yeah. there, correct? That's uh -huh. very good. And, and business is good, I'm assuming. Yes. <laughs> awesome. awesome. That's really good. And so, to, you know, um, I was looking up, I was, I was looking at Ecuador and one of the things I, I saw on it that was really interesting was, and we talked about the diversity of it, but, but to be more specific, it is a, uh, I, I saw that is a, what is called a mega diverse uh, yes. country and it's one of, there's only 14 mega diverse countries in the world mm -hmm. apparently. So can you, can you elaborate on what that means to be mega diverse? Yeah, so I, th I think it's in the top five biodiversity hotspots. Um, and it just basically means like per square meter or however they decide to measure it, like how many species can you find in that within different ecosystems? And then like all the countries are rated basically. Um, I mean, we are particularly fortunate because the cloud forest, for example, is one biodiversity hotspot and the Amazon is another biodiversity hotspot. 
the cloud forest, I mean, everyone talks about the Amazon. It's a tropical rainforest. Like, of course, it's biodiverse. It's biodiverse. And I think it spreads over nine countries. It's biodiverse in all the nine countries that you find it in. Um, what makes the, the rest of Ecuador particularly interesting for being biodiverse is because we have the Andes that run through. And like I was saying, there's jungle on both sides of the Andes. So you get very specific species at very specific altitudes. Um, each little mountain, each side of the mountain, each like elevation point at the island of the of the mountain becomes what we call a biological island, where species couldn't get up or around or over. And so like each little chunk on the mountain basically has species there that you can can't find anywhere else. Um, I think I can't remember the stat, the statistic, but like orchids are also, um, we're like biodiverse for orchids. I think there's oh, 10,000 wow. orchids worldwide. I think we have like 4,000 That's it. In, in Ecuador. Yeah. I can't remember if it's like 15,000 worldwide and 4,000 Ecuador, but something like that. That's and some amazing. ridiculous amount, like over 50% are endemic, <laughs> which means that like they're native here and can only be found mm -hmm. in Ecuador. Yeah, that, that is wild. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of times when people think of, of biodiversity, you know, they think of just the animal life, you know, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and a lot so, of times when they think of the animal life, they leave out the insects, not not thinking of insects yeah. are animals, too. Right. You know? So here's some. So here's uh, like I'm no I know the butterfly stats better. So there is about 20,000 butterflies worldwide. There are 5000 species in Ecuador. Um, if you want to talk about birds, there are 10,000 bird species worldwide, 1,500 species in Ecuador, and 600 species just in Mindo, which is one town in the cloud forest. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about like mega, <laughs> mega diverse. That's nice. That's really cool. I, I can't even imagine how cool that must be, you know, because when I live in Maryland, you know, we drive around, I see like six kinds of birds, maybe, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's more than that, but, but, uh, you know, um, we don't have a whole lot of like, you know, th there's almost no diversity here whatsoever. It's, it's, there's this very small sample size of animals and plants here and that's mm -hmm. it. So can yeah. we, can we talk climate change and, uh, sure. and in your area for, okay. So, yeah. um, <laughs> First, uh, my first question is, uh, how does um, global climate change kind of affect your region in, in South America and Ecuador in, in specifically and like in with your insect populations? Yeah, actually, I have data specifically for insects. Uh, one day when I was bored, I decided to read like a 200 page book on um, ground beetles living on mountains in Ecuador in Spanish. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Like so, who doesn't? Yeah. Right. I was like, someone asked me about beetles on mountains, and I was like, uh, I so mean, I found a book. That tome wasn't on my short list, but yeah, sure. sure Hi, okay. here we are. Tell us. Um, yeah. So, like I was talking about, how Ecuador is super biodiverse, and there are mm -hmm. some species that you can only find in Ecuador. Um, there are some beetles that you can only find on certain volcanoes. Like, not even in all of Ecuador. It's like this one beetle lives on this one volcano ever. Like, that's it, period. Um, and one of them is a volcano that I can actually see from my apartment. It's called Pichincha. You can see it on all sides of Quito if you come visit. And oh, I can't, what are the stats on it? Um, so it's a type of ground beetle. It's a flightless ground beetle. It's small, brown, and kind of boring. But uh, over the past 30 years, it has been pushed about 400 meters or about 1,200 feet up the mountain. And there was a, there's another ground beetle, um, I think on Cotopaxi or maybe Chimborazo, but it has lost 90% of its range in the past hundred years. Hmm. Um, and that's just because like the mountains are getting warmer. And so they just get pushed further and further and further up the mountains. And the, the question is like, when they get to the top and then it's still too warm, now what? Right. So, which uh, now, like you're talking about this one um, beetle population that's right in that one area. I mm -hmm. now, and I'm I'm saying this in a slightly ignorant way. So um, I'm gonna just go ahead and say it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But possibly there's not much uh, of a of an impact on humanity or the world, the greater world. Not that we want to see a, any you know life obviously die out. That said, what are um due to the climate change um what what kind of things what w are going to affect the bug population that is going to affect um you know humans 
Yeah. Um, so just on the ground beetle kind of thing, they're actually a really important link in the food chain. They're kind of apex predators uh, for where like for insects. And then they're like this missing link, a lot of birds eat them. So if, and there's actually a study on this in the Arctic about climate change, how that's affecting tiger beetles and how that, and ground beetles and how that is affecting like food webs, especially birds. Mm -hmm. So they, they are actually more important than you would think for like small little beetles. Right. That being said, um, in Ecuador, we're probably going to see pest species, uh, like, inhabit new areas so get further up the mountain so for instance mindo is high enough in the cloud forest right now that we don't have tropical diseases in there so it's really great if people want to see the rainforest but for whatever reason can't take malaria meds or don't want to or like are worried about um are worried about insect-borne diseases but still want to see the rainforest but like all right let's go to mindo because we can go there and there are no insect diseases but as climate change happens and these mountains warm for example, like those tropical diseases that you would normally find in the coast can cl start climbing up the mountain. Um, and not only just that, but not even just like mosquitoes and like disease vectors, but also you're going to start seeing um, increased range of pest species on agriculture, which, you know, Ecuador is where our coffee, our chocolate, our bananas and our palm oil comes from, to name a few. Mm. Uh, so I don't know if you like bananas, coffee, or chocolate, or anything that contains palm oil. <laughs> but, uh, you know what? You can take stuff. it all. Just don't take the coffee. Don't, don't take, take the, the coffee. coffee. Yeah. <laughs> no. The Cloud has some of the best coffee in the world. Um, and, you know, as, as temperatures rise and like these like pest insects are just going to like expand their range, basically. So, so does that that uh, I'm assuming that includes things like uh, fungus as well. Uh, I know that mm -hmm. ban bananas are having are having a hell of a time. There's a fungus that's going around. It's killing the the popular banana that we eat in America. I mean, I know you you all probably eat. Uh, you probably have the luxury of eating like 50 different like, kinds of bananas down there. We do. We get we get one. We get one. one crappy yeah. banana. Um, but <laughs> but they're clone. It's a it's a it's a it's a clone species. So it's a monoculture. This, yeah. Yeah, if, yeah. This, if this fungus affects one, it can it can it can wipe out the entire species. And that already banana. happened once. Um, like you know, you know how like that yeah. banana flavor. Yeah, yeah, it used to, apparently that's what bananas used to taste like, but that one got wiped out by some fungus, and so or some disease. I think it was a fungus, but yeah, it's a, we don't it's a fungus, see bananas yeah. or fungus. <laughs> yeah, they said that the uh, the what our grandparents, um, mm -hmm. our grandparents ate a different banana than we do. Yeah, yeah, and and it's because it was destroyed. It, it, and apparently it tasted like candy because every candy that tastes like banana tastes like that. But, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. But but as climate change increases, as, as the temperature gets gets um, warmer, uh, those kind of things can proliferate in areas that they couldn't mm -hmm. before. Right. And they, we're they we're also that. seeing a, a lot in sea level rise. So um, in one of the towns that I work in, actually, um, so in Mampiche, which is a little coastal town on, yeah, a little coastal town, like halfway down the country almost, um, like they've had to build a seawall. If you talk to all the locals, they're like, oh yeah, only like the dumb foreigners buy beachfront land because we all know it's going to be gone in 15 years. Like the beach mm -hmm. has already disappeared by like hundreds of meters in the past five or 10 years. Right. They had to build a wall in the past five or 10 years. It got destroyed this year. The wall that they built five, year, five or 10 years ago got destroyed this year by a high sea event. Um, there was like a, it wasn't like a tsunami. It was just like an extremely high tide with powerful waves and it just took down the seawall and like half the coastal towns in the North. Jeez. So sea level rise too. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, that's- All of the things. So well, yeah. what is the, how does the Ecuadorian government as a country and then I guess on local levels, how are they, what kind of impact? Uh, well, first of all, what is their stance on it? And then how is that having an impact on what you do and what, you know, mm -hmm. what science and just life can be like? I mean, like politics everywhere, there's like what they say and then <laughs> what ends up happening. Um, so the, how, let's see, how it works basically uh, is in a canton or in a, in a region, basically, um, there is the, the head government for that area. And then each of these little towns will have their own, um, 
each of these little towns will have their own, what's called the junta, which is like their own little local government. And some of them are more corrupt than others. So one of the reasons why some of the seawalls performed better than others is because the junta who had the money to allocate to the wall did like a half-ass job because like we could pay our buddies. So I mean, corruption well, is a thing that happens as well. We're not so, supposed to use build and or wall in the in this show anymore it's a, it's a, it's a it's a trigger it's a trigger term wait, wait. So, uh, we did we uh block that on our twitter feed or yeah. <laughs> twitter feed it's a seawall it's to keep the ocean from like destroying yeah. locally and you know we're going to have them oh my god new york's going to need one yeah, time. Manhattan's gonna need one big time. They're all there. There's gonna be a, a huge. They, there's, there's gonna be Baltimore a big City. wall around the, the shape of the United States. Yeah, where we live, we you live in a very coastal I, I don't, area. There's there's half of me that thinks they shouldn't build it for Baltimore City, but that's only half of me. <laughs> so just like Brian North Avenue, just start buying just some shoreline just shoreline it, just property. Wash, yeah. it out. wash it out. <laughs> this town needs an enema. Let's stick it right in Baltimore no, City. No, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. I'm kidding. I love my city. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, but but yeah, it, it's that's a, a major issue now. Um, so are you? So so David Benavides asked a question. I want to try and make sure we entertain the, the chat room from time to time. He, oh, yeah, he I, this, I, is a, this is a little ways back. He said, uh, "Are they still finding new species?" And I'm going to assume yes. It's got to be yes. Yeah. yeah. We're always funny. I have a, I have a friend. Uh, she studies spiders. She's the bug girl. Um, and she studies spiders in Ecuador. She actually, she's so cool. Um, she crowdfunded her research, which to me is just amazing. Awesome. So she crowdfunded her research to come down to Ecuador to study spiders. And, you know, that's part of what she did. She just collected a bunch and is naming new species. Um, yeah, oh, man, there's really tons cool. here. <laughs> man. And uh, Paul, um, Paul Nunes, who's always our little rebel rouser in the uh, room, but he actually had one good question after a few bad, bad <laughs> comments. One, one. one of his questions was, uh, and, and I mean, it, it, it is, you know, it's one of those uh, fantastic ones. Like, what is the largest bug around in your area, in your region? I'll move my head. <laughs> you see this oh. beetle back here? Uh huh. <laughs> Oh, All right, so he's no. not the biggest. Well, she's not. Oh, this is a male. He's not the biggest. He is one of the heaviest, though. The female of this species can weigh uh, up to the weight of a female rat, like a female full-grown rat, which is wow. a couple, a pound or two. Yeah. Um, so this is one of the big ones that you can oh, find. Out that this is a Hercules beetle. Actually, you know what? He can just come off the wall. One second. Anyway, we'll just bring the box closer. Oh nice. my oh, goodness! Look at that. That is awesome. Yeah, so I mean, it's head. it's uh it's fascinating. No, it's awesome. <laughs> I love beetles. I I know. Beetles I know. are amazing. Anyway, so um he's one of the largest. This is a male in the box. Uh, the females, pretty sure, are bigger. They're at least like fatter. Um, these are the males have these like really big horns on them to shove each other around so here's one you can find him in the amazon although there's one there's one species in the amazon and there's one species on the coast i'm not sure if they're this exact same species i don't know if they're subspecies but um yeah so it reminds me looking at that it reminds <laughs> me of these things that we have up in our area uh the, the uh, atlantic kind of uh, east eastern region um they're called i think they're called mud daubers no, not mud dubbers, because that's a wasp. Yeah, um, mud dubbers are a wasp. So. No, th this is a this is a type of um, uh, what do you what do you uh, dragonfly, um, I guess one of those the uglier version of it or whatever the the not a larvae but what is the some of the stages? Uh, the nymph, the naiad. Mm -hmm. They live underwater. So. Oh. Or are you talking about the Dobson fly? Which yes, I think I am. I think yeah. I am. And they, um, and they it, have it, the larvae that like come out of the rivers, and I look like they're like these big, long, tentacly demon-looking things. Yeah, and, yeah, and they just and, and we have them huge where in in our area, and the kids find them when we go camping, and like we we used to call it like Mothzilla Mothra, because <laughs> it does it has this and they flies and it has this mothy look to it. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, no, their their dobson flies are actually a completely different group of insects. Yeah. Uh, but they, despite their ferocious look, they eat pollen and nectar. Well, yeah, you know, <laughs> does that make you know, feel better? It's funny. It does. It's it. I, I don't want to say it's a false sense of security, but it's like you know, I eat with my eyes first, and that's just not good. You know, I have a so, picture of those on my Instagram. They're on my face to show you how like not dangerous they are. 
Mm. I'm so, glad you did it, that. It, it's funny because um, <laughs> I have this. I'm kind of notorious for this fear of spiders. Like I have this real like. Mm-hmm. But but I have actually been working on it. I have I have been working on it very strongly because I came to the conclusion probably three or four. No, nah, maybe. Oh God, it's been been about five or six years now. I was like, God, I'm in my forties. I have never, as far as I know, have never been bitten by a spider in my entire life. And oh, I've that's been a lie. It. You know you've been bitten. No. You probably no, actually haven't. I probably really? haven't. I, I no. thought that we, Anyway, we Mike, Mike, I'm on a thought here. Okay. So, so I, 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 because, and I was also, this, this came in conjunction with an article that I read that they said that, you know, spiders are very unlikely to bite you. And many times when you get bit, it's bit by something, you're probably bit by something else. And yeah, or you yeah. just scratched open something and it's like a bacterial infection and you didn't realize. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and the really bad ones, like when they, they show those, you see those pictures online of people like their their hands rotting off and stuff. They're like, mm-hmm. no spider does that. It might have mm-hmm. could possibly have started as a spider bite, but that is a bacterial infection. And exactly. and I was like, I need to reinvestigate this. So I started like, I don't know, I, I can now I don't pick them up with my hands. I still, that's that's a bit too far, a bit too far. But I can. I have rescued many spiders that have gotten like been in my my like in my house or at work. And like there was this big, nasty, hairy black thing. I mean, he was just he was like frightening looking. And and it wasn't a he. It was a she because she had a spider thing egg on her back with the. Mm. Aw, it's and, probably a wolf spider. Yeah, it was. It was a wolf spider. So mm. I took. I got a paper plate. And I slid it under her and I put a cup over her, a big coffee cup over her. I took her outside and I let her go. And people at work are just like, you're crazy. Why don't you just stomp on that? I'm like, because she's not hurting anybody. She's going to kill all the other insects that I don't like. You know, the yeah, other she's going to eat like. cockroaches for you. And yeah. they're, um, yeah, they're called wolf spiders because they don't spin webs to capture prey. They just run after them. <laughs> Yeah. Like that's, on foot. See, that's <laughs> less scary, right? Yeah. 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 That's. <laughs> I don't know. Are you the size of a cockroach? Then I wouldn't be afraid. No. They're pretty. They're super docile. Like people pick those up. Uh, not so. me. Not me. No, no that, that's I a mean... bri- that's a bridge too far. I'm I'm working on it, but that's that's just a, mm, it's a little too much. <laughs> I mean, uh, spiders can bite like if you harass them. So I always advise people that if it can bite you, to like not harass it and do exactly what you did. You know, there's a difference between being afraid of something and also like respecting it's an animal space. Yeah, yeah. I I really wish. I mean, I I, I God, I wish I could could do that i i i literally have a like this this irrational fear if it's in the house of like i it it's alive and it found its way in and it could find its way back it it must die its head must be on a i know i, I know i'm bad i know nancy i know i'm so bad and, and i just nancy, feel like it's yeah, its head must be, be on a pike to scare all the other ones away you know it's just you'll be you'll be proud of me i have i have a, I have a 10 year old daughter and we have a rule in our house. I've, I've established this rule with her for, for ever since she was younger. And the rule is we never kill anything we don't have to. We Excellent. Got, well, that's we get good. Ants, you get ants in the house. I'm sorry, but you got to kill them. They're a pest. Yeah. They're not just going to go will, away. They, they will, especially if they're carpenter ants, they will do damage to your house. Right. So they, they got to go. If it's an infestation of some kind, stink bugs, they, they got to go. Uh, but, they're invasive can, anyway. It's fine. <laughs> right. If you can catch the damn thing and let it outside, then that's that's the better. Yeah. You know you know what's funny? My ex-wife was definitely afraid of bats, and we'd get them in the house occasionally. I love bats. And I, I love loved it. Too. Yeah. yeah. And and I also, Pete, much like what you did, I was able to overcome uh, in a healthy way my fear of snakes. Um, and. You know, as as long as I know that the snake the snake has eaten recently, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm fine, you know, and and as long as it's okay with you know, because you can kind of see snakes are a little communicative with you know their their posturing, um, you know, it's not like they're gonna stick their hand up and, and go stop. Spiders but... are too, actually. So that's what I always like to tell people: like spiders actually have behaviors to warn you before they bite you. And like tarantulas have about four or five different behaviors that they'll go through before they even attack. Yeah. So the first thing they do, don't they, they not, maybe not the first thing, but one of the things I know they do, they, they kick those hairs off their legs, right? Yeah. And that's like three down the list. Uh, so the first thing they do is like run away. And the second thing they do if they're cornered is they'll like pull all their legs in yep. and try and look as sad as possible. <laughs> and then if you're still like harassing it, then it'll like throw its legs up and be like, 
I'm really big, here are my fangs, look at my big legs. And then if you're still <laughs> harassing it, like at this point, if you're, if you're still harassing it, um, it if, it's an old, if it's a new world spider, so the ones that you can find in the Americas, they'll kick off those hairs and then they'll itch. And if you're like, wow, that wasn't enough, and then you're still poking it, <laughs> then it might bite you. And I'm like, right. at that point, that's really a you problem and not really a spider right. problem. Right. Right. <laughs> I was I was actually playing with one down in – he didn't think it was playing, but I wasn't going to hurt him. Uh, when I was in um, California, 29 Palms, so Palm – I was up at the, the military base, 29 Palms, which is above Palm Springs. It's High Plains and High Plains Desert. And they had tarantulas running all over the place, these big fat ones. And um, I, I, was, I was messing with one with my boot. And the guy's like, you're not allowed to hurt them. I'm like, I'm not going to hurt him. I'm not going to hurt him. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just touching him. He's fine. Right? But he was putting his legs up and he's like, mm -hmm. he's like at my boot, you know. And then, yeah. then, I let him, then I left him alone. But I was just like. Right, exactly. And that's, and that's exactly what you should do. It's like. They let you know they're over it. The one, when people get bitten by spiders, it's like it was a spider in their glove and they actually put their put their glove on or like they put their shoe on and there is a, like that would have been left in the garage for years and they don't like flip it over. Um, mm. That's usually when people get bitten by spiders. Like, And so most spiders don't even see well. So if if they like walk onto you, they don't know what you are. They don't even know that you're something that can hurt them. So there's like, well, this substrate is oddly warm. How weird. <laughs> and that's it. Like it they have no nice. reason to bite you. Just out. No, I yeah. wonder what it tastes like. No, no, no. 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 Right, so I'm, I'm glad. They, they... they can already taste you because they have like all the little things around their and, fangs. And like those feet, are picking right? up like, yeah, those are picking up like, information basically about like how you sound and how you taste so yeah. they don't even need to bite you well guess what that 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 segues very well into uh david who asked the question that i was hoping someone would ask uh which is uh what actually he said he's not asking he's saying that he, he said jumping spiders are cute you they and i were are. talking about this before and i know that you said that they're like this big Yes, right, they're right. like millimeters. Um, Michael Doe, he does this amazing photography on jumping spiders. Like that's an Instagram to follow. And there's one of it on a matchstick. And then the head of the match takes up like the whole picture. And there's like this little itty bitty spider on it. Like it's, uh, it's very dangerous. It's, uh, <laughs> look, hey, yeah, yeah, what, what is that? Uh, that um australian jellyfish that you know is like oh that little dude barely... oh no yeah. that's a whole different dude mike that's a whole different thing yeah uh-huh yeah. is it is it yes is it yes is it they have no they have no brain they just yeah and their entire digestive brain. system is like floating around in their tentacles so they have to sting whatever's there spiders yes. are like very deliberate yes mm. in like mm. not you <laughs> But they are cute. They are so damn cute. And oh, all right, so you said this. You said this before, and I think this other people should know this. Like, uh, and is this only the jumping spider, or is this like other spiders that? And and tell us about the eyes. Yeah. So I think it's only jumping spiders. Or I think all spiders have this type of a vision, but um, jumping spiders have the most advanced insect or most advanced spider vision. With wolf spiders shortly after that so um i know this is exactly true for jumping spiders i'm not sure if it applies to some wolf spiders because again spiders are a little bit outside of my realm <laughs> i mainly deal with six-legged things anyway so jumping spiders um they have their um do you have you guys seen like the lucas animation like lucas the yes. jumping spider yeah, oh he has like iris. Cute. yeah like yeah. His, his eyes are completely wrong um he's adorable oh. but his eyes are wrong so um, he does he won't have irises, but they can move their eyes because uh, their retina is actually cone shaped. And so they can't focus like we can. They can really only focus by literally getting like closer or further away from things. And they also use um, green light to help them focus. But so the retina is cone shaped. And when they want to look around, they actually have to move the whole retina around. And so when the jumping spider is looking straight at you, he'll have black eyes. Um, this is very easy to tell in like the translucent jumping mm -hmm. spiders, like the green ones or the yellow ones. So if he's looking straight at you and the eyes are black, the big ones in the front, the rest of them are just simple light detectors. If he's looking somewhere else, the eyes will appear whatever color the rest of the spider is. So either green or yellow, depending on what color your spider is. Um, so you can actually see, like sometimes you can see them like looking up through the top of their head or like sometimes one eye is looking at you and the other eye is over here looking at something else. 
So Ooh. it's I, I I encourage you to get face to face with a very lovely like the green magnolia jumping spiders, for example, in the states um, in the eastern United States, you can see that really well with. Yeah, it might get really close. It's a jumping spider, so you can get close, and mm -hmm. you'll know that it could jump. So yeah. They're, they're actually super cute. They're really territorial. So if you try and take a picture of them, they see the reflection in the camera and jump at it like, I don't know, like a cat or a bird or something. So nice. but I think that's pretty adorable. All right. So in the interest of time, let's quickly uh, cover stink bugs because I heard recently that there was a huge scare and oh, the polar vortex was eating all of the, you know, killing all of the stink bugs. And as I was doing research for this, I, I read an article that was like, nope, that's not the case. No, yeah, not, so. yeah, not really. Insects have a, a lot of different mechanisms to be ha to be able to handle cold. And I'm going to start off with saying, like, a lot of our invasives come from Asia. Um, and it's just because Asia and the United States have very similar climate. Mm. Uh, so, like, the insects that come over can already handle cold because right? they already have to deal with snow and stuff um, and below freezing temperatures. That's why um, a lot of invasives from like South America, for example, don't make it much further than Florida because all of a sudden they freeze to death. So if your invasives are coming from somewhere like Asia, um, they actually can, for the most part, handle snow and cold. And insects have a variety of different ways to be able to do that. Mm. Uh, so the polar vortex is not going to really kill, kill the insects. Not only, unfortunately. I mean, damn it. <laughs> yeah, damn it. Um, I mean, not that there's anything thing. wrong with that, but, right. uh, you um, know. At most, it may reduce their population a little bit, but probably not enough to notice, as again, since they're invasive species. So even if, like, most of them survive, they still are producing offspring at, an, at like, an exponential rate. Now, Paul's asking a question, which is uh, related to what my mom and I were talking about Um Today, and she's watching the show too and she said that she was like oh one uh, yeah. <laughs> um hello from ecuador mom and yeah. <laughs> uh, and when she said when she was a little girl she, her she would always take bugs from outside she was actually a very um loved and was into bugs uh, so what happened to you i i, I don't know <laughs> i it didn't translate i'll tell you that but so she would her parents would always find my grandparents would always find uh, bugs in the freezer because she'd go in and freeze them. And so Paul's asking, like, don't bugs have antifreeze in their systems to prevent yeah, them from freezing? Yeah, it, so um, so, um, so um, what? So, oof, that's so complicated. All right. So when you find an insect during like the summer, which is probably when you're finding them, mm -hmm. um, d they will get different signals from light and temperature. And this slow change in light and temperature will tell the insects that it's time to go into diapause, which is basically like hibernation. Mm -hmm. And different insects go into this stage at, or go into this state at different stages. Some do it as eggs, some do it as larvae, some do it as pupa, and some do it as adults. Um, and so, uh, first of all, if she's collecting an adult that normally diapauses as a pupa, like it'll die. Um, mm. The other thing is, it's that slow, gradual change which triggers the production of these proteins. So p taking it out of a summer day that's 90 degrees and throwing it in your freezer will kill it. However, uh, I always advise that if you use your freezer, you should leave them in there for a good week or so um, because there are some particularly like large, hardy insects uh, like mantises for example and some moths that if you leave them in for only 24 hours they will wake up afterwards so yeah so uh, and she, that's they, what she said she said yeah. she, they, she pulled them out the next day and she was fascinated with yeah. them coming out you know of their torpor and mm -hmm. and flying away yeah exactly so if you want to freeze your insects then you either and you want to freeze them fast and you need a minus 20 freezer minus 20 degree centigrade freezer uh, otherwise, in your regular freezer, you should wait a good week before yeah. you take them out. Mm -hmm. Well, she probably had a really low grade, you know, 1950s type <laughs> freezer. freezer. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was but, a glorified uh, refrigerator. <laughs> I, I think that possibly is where I got, you know, the incentive to kill bugs. Is my <laughs> That's the part that my mother... <laughs> you you know. open up the freezer like, why is there a moth flying at me? I only wanted ice cream. What is happening? <laughs> All right, so real quick, because we, we're, we're, we're going to be running out of time really quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, ha I have one bug that I want to mention that, that you apparently they have in Ecuador in, in abundance because when I pulled it up on Wikipedia, it was one of the one of the ones I saw. 
uh, or maybe not Wikipedia, one of the sites talking about bugs in Ecuador, and it's the uh, assassin bugs, or um, sometimes yeah. the wheel bugs. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Mike, these are essentially flying spiders, just so you know. Nancy, go ahead. Tell me about the uh, flying spiders. <laughs> Assassin bugs are actually an entire family. They're yep. one of the most diverse families of insects. And in that, um, so they are what's called a true bug, which is the worst common name. But true bug in entomology actually specifically refers to a, a order a suborder of insects. Um, and basically they're characterized as they have like a, a, the first half of their wing is hardened into like a leathery state. And then the other half is membranous. And then they have this long beak, which uh, isn't called a proboscis because it's its own evolutionarily de derived things. So of course it's biology. So we have to give it its own name. So it's a beak. Um, but that's how these assassin bugs do um, they're assassinating. <laughs> so a lot of them have elongated forelegs like mantises, not, exa not as exaggerated as a mantis, but they'll be a little bit longer and they'll like sit and wait for something to come by and they'll, and they'll grab it out of the air and then they stab it with their liquidy, with their mouth part and they spit digestive enzymes into their prey uh, and it liquefies and then they slurp it back up like a Slurpee. That's so uh, that's, Brund that's Brundlefly right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so did you ever so, see that movie, The Fly? Has hmm? she ever seen it? Did you ever see the movie, The Fly? I did actually. Okay, yes. there you go. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say because they're and apparently they're they're fairly aggressive. So if you mess with them, they will apparently they'll bite you. From what I read, from what I read, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, who are you reading this from? Like entomologists? Like if you pick it up and you like close your hands around it like this, like, yeah, it'll get scared and it'll bite you. Again, I have one of those on my face to show you that if you treat it with care, then like it's not going to bite you. And it's a wheel bug. It's like one of the, and the reason why they like. hurt so much <laughs> is because of that digestive enzyme that they have in their venom. Um, Shannon's asking, are they venomous? They are. Well, yes. yeah. well, I mean, technically, yeah, I'd say they're venomous. It's a digestive spit that they excrete through so, an injection method. So, yes. You'll get and, right. and what would that do to my hand? It would just hurt. It, so the worst thing about them, really, uh, is because it's like a digestive enzyme, um, you don't really bleed. So right. it hurts. Like, it hurts like fuck, basically. There's no other way to describe it because I've been bitten by like a couple of them. It hurts so bad. And you have nothing to show for it. No bump, no like bleeding flesh wound, no like scab, nothing. You're like, this hurts. And everyone's like, there's nothing there. You're oh, like, no, no. <laughs> I'm like dying. It really hurts. Yeah. Awesome. If you talk to anyone, everyone says they're, they're true bugs. Everyone says they, they hurt so bad. Yeah. God, who, who's the guy that gets bitten by all the bugs all over the world? What is his um, name? His name is Justin Smith. Yeah. And I have his book. It's He's really the guy good. that stuck his hand in the glove with the bullet ants, like the yeah. natives do, and yeah, uh, yeah, the... lovingly described it. <laughs> yes, that He's... was the best thing about bullet ants is that there's no anti venom and there's really no danger to you other than it really hurts. So if you get uh, stung by it's actually a sting, it's, it's not a bite. Sting, you you're right, you're right. Sorry, it, my bad. Um, in like the Amazon, for example, like I've heard, like all the locals are like, ha ha, that sucks. <laughs> and then there's like nothing that they can do because you're like two hours up the Amazon River or the Napo River, and they're like, well, here's some Advil. Mm. It's gonna, it's gonna kind of suck for the next he's, 24 he's to 48 hours. Just oh my God, out. 24 to 48 hours. <laughs> yeah. mm. oh. oh. All right. On that right. note, uh, Pete. Yeah. Are we going to play a game? We are oh, no. Going, we are going to I'm play a game. I'm trying to stall. Game. Stall, stall, stall. <laughs> no, it's going to be a fun game. And, and, and Nancy, you, after talking to you for some time now, uh, you def Mike, I'm sorry. She's going uh, to have the advantage yeah. in a big way. That's really how that works, isn't it, bud? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, thanks so there. Give, wait, Mike, let's, let's give out some links real quick just in case. So um, make sure to go to uh, cybugs.info. Real simple. Uh, that's that's mm -hmm. uh, Nancy's website. Uh, you can find her at uh, uh, on Twitter at Cybugs, and also and you're on at Cybugs on i on Instagram as well, right? I'm actually, just oh. at Cy dot Bugs, but I Cy. think okay. um, if you look up Cybugs, I pop up anyway. So okay. yeah, and then on Facebook, my actual Facebook page is also Cybugs. So I have like, and my YouTube is also Cybugs. Cybugs. So yes. <laughs> I've like slurped oh. up all of the 
<laughs> oh, be before yeah, I, she also sells merchandise. She sells really cool jewelry, like bug bug jewelry, bug. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so jewelry. it's it's on pause for the next month because my friend who helps me do all my shipping is cur is in Costa Rica. She's in Panama, Costa Rica, and came in uh, this this term abroad. So check back in a month and then we <laughs> ship things out again. Could I get an assassin bug? Yeah. What do you say? Could I get an assassin bug? I, I you can't actually. You get beetles. It's beetle beetle jewelry. I want an assassin jewelry. jewelry. I was gonna send it to Pete. Oh. <laughs> not <laughs> a living one. Not a living one. I'm not I'm not that bad. You can get one off a of bioquip. I'm sure. Huh. If you want like a dead bug on your wall, or oh, to okay. send to your friends, because nice. <laughs> nothing says love yeah. <laughs> like preserved <laughs> insects. Oh, Pete has sent me worse. <laughs> okay. All right. What? Here here we go. All right, everybody, it's game time with the Mythwits. I'll be your game master this week, and we are playing the Creepy Crawly Challenge. I'm going to give you a name, and you must tell me if it's a real bug or if it's something that I either made up or got from somewhere else. Oh, boy. All right, yeah. Uh, this is a fun one. Um, I was going to do sound effects, but, God, it is so hard because I know – I know there's like bugs that sound like machines and stuff and I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna download some sounds of machines and some bugs and drive you all nuts with that. But uh, it was too much of a, it was, it was really too much of a dig to find all that. So I, um, I found some really cool, interesting names for bugs uh, and I threw in some fake ones. So I made up some ones that, uh, you know, who I, I thought kind of sound like these weird bug names. So we are going to go. Uh, um, oh, wait a minute. I got to change the names here, Mike. I just did. I just did. I, I just did changed. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, did you? Did you change the other one? Yep. Sorry. Sorry, folks. Okay. So um, so we're going to do. Uh, Mike, I, do you, you want to go first or you want Nancy to go first? Uh, well, uh, yeah. I don't <laughs> know. Yes, I'll mm -hmm. go first. You want to go first? Will it matter? Will I lose any worse or better? I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. Let's All right, Mike. Yeah. Mike, you're uh, <laughs> your first uh, bug or 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 not a bug uh, is uh, Villa Manili. Man, man, Manilia. Villa Manilia. Kind of like Villa Millie Vanilli. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like that. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, see... Nancy, at least when I do it, I'll at least find some somebody who's fed a bunch of bugs into like a, um, a learning. Um, what do you call those neural networks? You know, who it, it, a computer made them up. So <laughs> you uh, subject a bot to like 10,000 yeah. hours of bug yeah. names and see what it comes out with. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, all right. I'm going to say that that is not a bug name. That is uh, that is not a creepy crawly. That is something I made up. That's what I'm saying. Or, or, or somebody made hey. up, right? Girl, you know it's true. Okay. Well, Mike. <laughs> entomologist Neil L. Evan Huss named a species of villa fly in 1993. The name he selected was Villa Manili. Uh, I'm sure he was in no way influenced by the name of the pop music duo Millie Vanilli, who won a Grammy in 1990, which was then res rescinded because they were lip syncing. So, Mike. Nancy, that did you know that one? I didn't actually know that one, so I'm glad you got it. Yes! <laughs> All right. Fantastic. All right. So, so Nancy, you are up. Here's your first one. Avada Kedavra. Uh, that is a Harry Potter spell. Damn it. See, I should have given that one to Mike. I had to keep it random. I knew he wouldn't know that one. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> Very good, Nancy. You know you, whoop, you know your Potter. You know your Harry Potter. All right. Very good. Mike? Yo. Yeah, yeah, I should have made you go second. Damn it, I knew you wouldn't. <laughs> All right, so Mike, here's here's your next bug, or not a bug. Uh, okay. Here's to ya. Here's to ya. What? Here's to ya. Uh, could you use it in a sentence? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to spell it? <laughs> ah, fuck, I got bit by a here's to ya. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, uh... Maybe no, no. No, well, sure. How about a spelling know. for real? How about a spelling? Okay, H E E R Z T O O Y A. Here's oh yeah, it's, a, it's it's got a Z in it. Definitely a bug. 
Definitely a bug. Okay. Yeah. You are correct. Yeah. Here's is a genus of parasitic moth found in Mexico. Here's to you was first described by Paul Marsh in 1993. And I looked it up. That's exactly how it's supposed to be pronounced. Yeah. Entomologists are pretty funny. We like, we like jokes. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, you're a great bunch. What can I say? I mean, you study bugs. I mean, you have to have a sense of humor. <laughs> Great swarm of guys you We are. love the, like, the thing that everyone else in the world hates. So, I mean, you, you just have to have a sense of humor, I guess. Right, right, right. <laughs> I don't hate. I, I do have a fascination with all these things. It's just, uh, I, 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 you know, not in my back or front or side yard. So, <laughs> All right. All right, Nancy, let's see. Here's your next one. It's Yabecha Bagali. Is the name of this bug? Can I have not? a spelling? <laughs> e U B E T I A B I G A U L A E. You betcha by golly. Hmm. Oh boy. That's a good one. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh, the pressure, the pressure. I guess it doesn't actually really matter. The, <laughs> the points are made up and the rules don't matter. <laughs> that's, right. that's exactly right. There you go. Hey, uh, you played. Sure. Yes. It's a bug. That's a bug? Oh. You betcha by golly is a moth from the family. I ah, forget it. The species pronounced you betcha by golly. For that, we can thank Smithsonian entomologist John Brown, who discovered the species in Venezuela in 1999. You nice. betcha by golly. You betcha by golly. <laughs> I guess, Damn. you know, like these old timey entomologists that actually need things right. seriously, like this new generation, like. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Boating right. McDuck face. Do you know why no. this happened, though? Because, no, like, when studies come out and say, like, oh, a new mammal was found, like, it gets so much press, regardless of what it's called. But no one really cares about bugs. Mm -hmm. You have to name it something funny or something weird. So then it hits the press, and then, like, people care, basically. So that's why, that's why they have these weird names. I'll buy that. All right, yeah, I believe it. All right, so uh, where are we? We're with uh, we're Mike, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if this one is Vespula Matayu. Vespula Matayu. No, you got that from Princess Vespa. No, not a bug. Okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You're, sorry, sorry, sorry. You're correct. It is not a bug, <laughs> but it has nothing to do with Vespa from. Um, from no, uh, no. space balls it's a oh. uh, vespula is actually a wasp right it's a type of it's it's a uh, it's a name for wasp uh and i it, <laughs> uh, i made up out of whole cloth i just said you know i looked at what's scientific name for a wasp and it was vespula i was like what can i do with that so oh. that's yeah i just made it up okay all right fantastic good good call all right i love it when i'm right for the wrong reasons yes <laughs> it's always the best oh, all right nancy here's your next one uh Piss on you. Piss on you. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to go with not a bug on that one. Not a bug on that one. Are you sure? I guess so. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Arnold, <laughs> Arnold Minky was responsible for naming the Central American wasp called Piss oh, on man. You in 1988. It's P-I-S-O-N-E-U. Oh, I see. I was like, I was like, how did they get that to go through? But if they spell it weird like that, yeah, I guess so. Wow. So that's like the pissing cockroach. Yes. <laughs> oh my god. All right. All right, Mike. Yes. Mike. Uh, yours is Trombicula fujigamo. Um. Could you say oh. that? <laughs> Two, more times. Two more times backwards. <laughs> no. It'll probably sound the same, to be honest. Right. Now, did I did I make a name that sounded kind of serious? So that From I, could the up on you? I didn't do anything I, funny with this one. I, I don't know. I, I'm going to need you to just try that one more time. Trambicula. Trambicula. Mm. Fujimo. Fujimo. Oh. Fuji. Uh, Fuji GMO. Um, oh, Jesus. Uh, I'm not even going to ask how it's spelled, but I'm 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 going to say that it's a bug. That's correct. 
Wow. Nice guess. But what makes this one interesting is that it's a chigger, and the chigger is named is an acronym for the military slang for, and it's F-U-J-I-G-M-O, fuck you, Jack, I got my orders. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm totally serious. <laughs> wow. I feel like I should look up more bug names. I can't yeah. say it's not something, it's something I do very often. Oh, well, right. uh, you know what? I don't either. It doesn't seem to have a bearing on how I'm doing either. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, here's the last You're one, Nancy. Matched. Here's the last one. Polmistus. I think it's P-O-L-E-M-I-S-T-U-S. Polmistus Spock. Yeah, I think that was a bug. Oh, oh sorry. I it is a play. I did play on a real one though. Uh, oh, you favorite. did. It says, however, uh, it's, it's fake, but however, there are three species of apoid wasps that are named Palmistus Chewbacca, Palmistus Vaderi, mm -hmm. and Palmistus Yoda. Renowned entomologist and Star Wars fan Arnold S. Minky, our boy Minky, gave the first of those first two of those names in 1983, and P. Yoda was named by fellow entomologist Charles Vincent in the same year. Really? No one, no one did Star Trek ever. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, so sad. I, I, yeah. So I would, yeah, I would have thought you'd have more. I was like, uh, I knew there was a, I knew there was a Chewbacca one, so I was like, oh, of course, that yeah. means someone would name would just keep going. Apparently, right, apparently right. not. I'm wow. trying to switch it up. Star Trek fans are just, just sad. It is a sad day for them. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. So basically, I've just basically done better than um, chance because that's all yeah. I did. Yeah, you just guessed. You just huh. guessed. But you know what? You did this. You got to win. Mike rarely gets to win, Nancy. I, I rarely gets mind. to win. Hey, I, how, how embarrassing for me. The sun, shines, <laughs> the sun shines on that larvae every once in a while, right? Ugh. I would just like to defend myself and say there are 1.2 million described insect species. Oh, yeah. So I didn't have a much better chance than chance either. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's, no. Look, the, like you said, the rules are completely made up. The points don't, the really points don't matter. Anything, right? It really doesn't uh, matter. It's... Well, I'd, I'd like to thank the, the Academy and <laughs> all the bugs at sea. Your mom. And my and mom, mom, yes, for freezing all those poor moths. Oh, God, David says, piss in me is a kinky bug from Asia. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Noon said, hey, it's a golden showers beetle. <laughs> oh, uh oh, the room's on fire. Look out. Oh, <laughs> all right. There, there is a fly named after Beyonce, and there, I forget what bug it is, but it has the name Bazinga from Big Bang Theory <laughs> nice. as well. Oh, that's and there's nuts. a Schwarzenegger beetle, right? I'm I sure. Think so. I think there there's is. a there's a moth named after Trump as well because he has like fluff on the top of his head that looks oh, yeah. like his hair. Is that the one <laughs> that if you touch it, it'll like hurt you, or is that the, that's a different? One uh, so the the moth that actually has the like Trump in its what's called the species name is called specific epithet, um, and that one's a different species. However, the common name for the flannel moth caterpillars is also called the Trump caterpillar, and okay. they kill you in Ecuador, so or can so don't oh. touch them. Really? Oh my god! Yeah. Don't so touch the like, fluffy caterpillars. So you can be Yeah, no, up. everyone's like, aren't you afraid of the spiders, the bullet ants, like, et cetera? And I'm like, no, I'm going to slip and, like, put my hand on a tree, and there's going to be, like, some crazy venomous caterpillar, and it's just going to hurt. <laughs> that's That would have been a good game in retrospect, because that's what we do here is have great ideas after the fact. Yeah. Is is this a bug that can kill you or not kill you? <laughs> yeah, right. there we go. Well, you just have to have me back then, so I can redeem yeah. myself at the game yeah. that doesn't matter. <laughs> you will come back. I will make that game, and you will play against Peter. Right. Excellent. <laughs> uh, Nancy, you're always welcome back. Great guest. I'm so yeah. glad you came it, back on. Thanks so much. It was so I, fun. I was so we happy covered... when you when you replied and you were like, yeah, I definitely love to do it. I was like, yay. So, so Yeah, no, I, I love this. <laughs> covered Good. most of what we wanted to cover, but we definitely would love to cover more. Um, and uh, for anyone else, we didn't get a chance to discuss all of the cute bugs. So it, in the show notes, uh, I will put a link to um, just, I mean, there are several of these, you know, sites. The that panda always... ant is definitely one people should look up. Okay. Panda ant. Okay. Yeah. It's not actually an ant. It's a wingless wasp, but it, it looks like a panda. Okay. Cute. Oh, and I'll, so I'll have a link to the, the, is this one site that has a whole listing of like a bunch of uh, really, and they are, I mean, you know, cute as far as bugs can be cute. So yes. adorable. Uh, uh, totes adorbs. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, right. All right, everybody. Let's do it. Let's do the thing. All right, everybody, can make sure. Plug? Can you do Is a that... shameless plug? Can yeah, I do a absolutely. shameless plug? Oh, please, I plug am. away, plug so, away. On Tuesdays and Fridays on my Periscope channel, which streams directly to my Twitter, I do live videos about bugs and Ecuador. So if you liked this kind of thing, you don't have to be sad to see me go. You can watch me every Tuesday and every Friday. Please do. That's uh, I, I. I think I found you on you. I think I found you on YouTube. Your YouTube channel, I believe. Again, so I mean, pre found you. Is your YouTube yeah. channel Cybugs? Did we say it is? Um, but I do the live streaming on Periscope, which okay. is um, that'll be on Twitter. Yeah. So okay. it streams directly to my Twitter, and then you can click on it, and then Periscope's like, "Do you want to follow this Periscope person?" And my Periscope's the exact same as my Twitter, so it doesn't doesn't really matter. The only okay. thing is, if you watch in the Periscope app, then you can like comment and stuff. If you just watch from Twitter, then you just watch me talk oh, so periscope right. has its own app yeah and yeah gonna... oh it started out that way and i think twitter absorbed them i believe right? yeah and then yeah okay so now and then do you then post them to youtube after the fact i don't they actually just live on periscope okay all right oh yeah. god more social usually what happens is like i i will like research something and then do the periscope live and then if i like that topic then i'll make like a nice edited video to put on YouTube. Okay. okay. And that's, you said again, that was Tuesdays and? Fridays. Fridays at what time? Uh, Fridays, it's at 4 p.m. EST, and on Tuesdays, it's at 1 p.m. But like the Tuesday one's a little bit spotty because sometimes I'm traveling and then I'm like, I'm like in the middle of nowhere. I can't, but I usually in my apartment on Fridays. So I almost always get, I almost always do the Periscope on Fridays. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And, and yeah. from the videos I've seen, sometimes you like, you've got bugs and sometimes they're on your face and sometimes <laughs> you're holding them and they're like crawling around and, yeah. and, and, and jumping so everywhere. Yeah. Right. Right. Good. That's, that's <laughs> fantastic. All right, Nancy. Well, thank you very much. Everybody make sure you check thank out so info and uh, follow her on Twitter at Cybugs and on Instagram Cy.Bugs and of course Periscript as we just talked about. But unfortunately, we always hate to go. Uh, our guests, we, we could talk to our guests for hours, and we used to, Mike, until people mm. were like, can you shorten this goddamn Too thing Too long. <laughs> we need to eat. We need to use the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. Too exactly. Long. So until next time, you just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Mythwits. And this one, Mike, this one was really oh. awesome. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher so you can just listen. Uh, do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. And make sure to share your favorite episode on the social medias, any one of them, to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet. Uh, tweet us at Mythwits and check out Mythwits.com. Mythwits is produced by Aether Forge Creations as part of the TSR Podcast Network. A lot of good shows on that network, Mike. A lot of them, like uh, Wargaming Recon. We did some stuff with Game School this past weekend. Yeah. Uh, Game Society. Chad's been kicking out episodes lately. He had a little break there, but he's doing it again. Uh, anyway, check out TSRPN.com and AetherForge.com for more cool stuff. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it. Don't sell it. And don't freeze it in carbonite and try to sell it to a crime boss. Thanks, everybody, for listening. <laughs> Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike. Anthony T. Hanks said, A forest's beauty lies with its inhabitants. Agreed. Very good. Good statement. Good statement. All right. Ciao.